Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. So, good morning, and welcome to the Center for Race and Public Education in the South Spring Lecture. Uh, I am Dr. Derek Allridge, Director of the Center for Race and Public Education in the South. And as we kick off this lecture, it is my honor to have our new Dean of the School of Education and Human Development give our welcome. Uh, Dr. Yeah, let's give her a hand. <laughs> Dr. Stephanie Rowley is a very good friend of mine. She is a world-renowned psychologist and scholar, and she is the first African-American Dean in the School of Education and Human Development. So needless to say, we are very proud of her and we are happy to have her here. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to the Dean to give us a welcome. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It was so wonderful to walk in the room and feel the love and excitement and the warmth of, of our community. I'm so glad to see everyone here today. So thank you, Dr. Allridge, for that warm and wonderful welcome. It's really a pleasure to be here today for this wonderful lecture uh, by the Honorable Esther Vassar. So I'm gonna begin with our land acknowledgement. Right. As we begin today's lecture, Please join me in acknowledging the Monacan and Powhatan people as the traditional custodians of the land in and around the lands we are on today. Dispossessed of these lands and continuing to live with that legacy, we pay respect to the elders, past and present. Our acknowledgement of the Monacan and Powhatan people reflects a commitment to respect and greater inclusion through a formal recognition of those who were, who were here first and whose continued presence is important to our future. We also acknowledge and pay respect to the individual lives of the African peoples and their descendants who were forced to dedicate their labor to the construction of what is now the University of Virginia. Scholars estimate that at least 5,000 enslaved black laborers worked on the grounds with many in residence, starting with the construction of the lawn in 1817 and lasting through the end of the Civil War in 1865. These enslaved people built and then sustained the everyday life of the university. These acknowledgments are but one form of a public in intervention, but serve as a necessary step toward honoring the Monacan and Powhatan people and enslaved laborers. We reflect on the injustices committed to these native communities and, and enslaved peoples. We honor their stories told and untold and their descendants past and leaders present and emerging. So here at the School of Education and Human Development, we clearly value diversity, equity and inclusion in all its complexity and richness. Dr. Allridge initiated conversations about the development of a new research center at the school in 2016. After the Unite the Right rally in August of 2017, there was a clear and urgent need for leadership relating to race and education with an emphasis on the fo on, and focus on the Southern United States. And this center was launched officially in 2018, having an immediate impact. CRPES conducts and supports research and scholarship on a variety of issues that lie at the intersection of race, education, and schooling in the southern United States. The collective work at CRPES illuminates the causes, consequences, and potential means of ameliorating disparities in African American use, exper educational experiences, and achievement. The center is also currently working on initiatives to improve the teaching of African American history in K-12 education and to recruit more black students into the teaching profession. Today's lecture is also in collaboration with the Teachers in the Movement Project. Funded by the Spencer Foundation, the project explores teachers' ideas and pedagogy inside and outside the classroom during the Civil Rights Movement. From teachers themselves, we learn how their pedagogy, curricula, and community work were instrumental forms of activism that influenced the movement. The Honorable Esther H. Vassar is one of nearly 400 distinguished ed educators to have participated in the project to date. 
Interviews are preserved as a historic record using classroom presentations cited by scholars and housed in the Teachers in the Movement web-based portal to benefit students, teachers, researchers, and the public. And I have to say, uh, I've been familiar with the project for many years, and as I imagine being dean at the School of Education, I was just so proud to, to be affiliated even with uh, Teachers in the Movement, but certainly as a scholar uh, with the Center for Research on Public Education in the South. So I am thrilled to be here today. And now I will turn it back over to our fearless leader to give some announcements and to introduce Daryl Dance, who will introduce our guest speaker. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Dean Rowley. Um, let me say I want to give a special thanks to Mr. James Bryan. Where are you, Mr. Bryan? <laughs> yeah. uh, Mr. Bryan is a good friend of mine, but he's also a researcher with the Teachers in the Movement Project and is largely responsible for many of the interviews we have been able to do, not only in Charlottesville, but throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. So thank you, Mr. Bryan. Also wanna, yes. I also want to recognize the Lane High School students, class of 1972. If you would, would you please stand? Yes. Thank you, thank you. And I need to thank Barbara Fitch, if y'all know her, y'all know her? Yes. You gotta know her, right? Uh, she has done an extraordinary job in help bringing this um, lecture together today. She's done almost all the logistical work, so we gotta give her a round of applause. And to, to Caroline Webster, who also works in the Center of Race and Public Education in South, who's provided logistical support, and to Ryan Hethcock here in the back, a videographer with our project. <laughs> So please allow me to introduce Dr. Daryl Dance, who will introduce our speaker. Dr. Daryl Cumber Dance was born in Richmond, Virginia to elementary school teacher Veronica Bell Cumber and entrepreneur Alan Cumber. Dance graduated from Ruthville High School in Ruthville, Virginia, and went on to earn her AB degree in English and her MA degree in English, both from Virginia State College, now Virginia State University. She received her PhD degree in English from the University of Virginia in 1971. Yes. Um, she has also uh, been a teacher and she taught at Armstrong High School up until 1962 when she returned to our alma mater, Virginia State College as an instructor of English. After obtaining her PhD, she returned to Virginia State College for one year as an assistant professor of English she left in 1972 to join the faculty of Virginia Commonwealth University as an assistant professor of English, becoming an associate professor of English in 1978 and obtaining full professorship in 1985. Between 1983 and 1984, Dr. Dance served as the acting coordinator of Afro-American Studies program at the Virginia Commonwealth University. And in 1993, she joined the faculty of the University of Richmond as a professor of English. She was named the Sterling A. Brown Professor of English at Howard University in 2013. And she served as the Jesse Ball DuPont Visiting Scholar at the University of Richmond, as well as the Visiting Professor of Black Studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. She has authored nine books, can't imagine that. But really, more than that, am I correct, uh, Dr. Dance? Because you told me you uh, uh, completed some books during COVID. <laughs> Four. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> That's incredible. And of course, she's received numerous awards, too many for me to even begin to mention. But let me just say that I've admired Dr. Dance's work for some time, and I'm glad to have her here. So welcome. Let's give you a round of applause. For being here. And at, at this point, I want to turn it over to Dr. Dance for her to introduce our illustrious speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> here I am again, introducing the renowned Esther Vassar for the umpteenth time. 
I've had this pleasant task for more than 40 years. <clears throat> it has been so easy because there are so many glowing tributes I can offer to my illustrious friend and colleague. After all, I have figuratively and literally followed her career since those bygone days when my hair was black, <laughs> my memory unfailing, my body whole, my back straight, and my gait balanced. I was there to introduce her when we were both on the faculty at Virginia Commonwealth University. I was there to introduce her when she moved into major roles in the Warner administration and the Wilder administration. I was there to play my supporting role when she was supervising the history-making African Trade Conference in Williamsburg. I was there to play my supplementary role when she oversaw Governor Wilder's trade mission to Senegal. I was there to introduce her when she became chairman of the Virginia ABC board. I was there to introduce her <laughs> when she retired from the Obama administration. <laughs> Some might say that I have been fortunate for the many opportunities afforded me by holding on to this lady's coattails, <laughs> by being the Sancho to her Don Quixote, <laughs> the Abernathy to her Martin Luther King, the Jerry Lewis to her Dean Martin. <laughs> and it has certainly been a rewarding and even fascinating adventure. However, <laughs> As much as I have benefited from our long relationship, I must confide to you that the true beneficiary is Esther Vassar. Where else could she find someone who followed and applauded her career <laughs> with such enthusiasm? Someone who can speak so knowingly and passionately about her triumphs, who can so graciously and even perhaps sometimes a bit articulately <laughs> lay the groundwork for her discourse. Who else could she find who could so prepare an audience for her eloquent keynote address? Who else <laughs> could so cautiously restrain one's own linguistic gifts so as not to upstage the lady <laughs> of the hour? <laughs> who else? could so carefully understate her own fashion panache <laughs> so as not to outshine the always elegant Esther Vassar. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am that appointed vessel. <laughs> and it is today, again, my great pleasure to present to you the truly legendary teacher the dedicated social reformer, the unmatched organizer and facilitator, the innovative entrepreneur, the beloved and applauded leader in state and national governmental agencies, the unmatched and charismatic personality, the peerless orator, and my dear, dear friend, the one and only Esther Vassar, ladies and gentlemen. Daryl introduced me, she was followed by Shauna when I retired. And Shauna said, oh my God, why did you do this to me? <laughs> well, you now, I now know how you feel, Shauna. Because I told her this one her, was her best one yet. And she said, do I have to get it, do it again? I said, yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm honored to be here in this place on this beautiful day, because yesterday wasn't so beautiful for me. <laughs> so there are so many people whom I, I must thank for my presence here today. For except for a brief visit to participate in work-related events while working in various state positions, I've not been on the university campus of Virginia since 19, for 51 years ago. Thank you, Dr. Derek Aldridge, for inviting me. And I thank the University of Virginia for welcoming back 
one who came here as a student more than 53 years ago. Before Dr. Houston Baker, a fellow Howard University graduate, and before Dr. Joseph Washington, who officiated my wedding here on the campus of University of Virginia, I didn't know that wasn't common, in 1971. And that was before Dr. Baker or Dr. Washington came. Also, thank you, Dr. Aldridge, for inviting Daryl to introduce me. You see why? <laughs> because if I fail you, she does not. So, Dr. Dance is my former colleague at Virginia Commonwealth University. Most of all, she's a precious friend for more than 40 years. Dr. Dance's cousin, Shauna Epps, who's sitting over there by her, yet another friend, dear friend, drove Dr. Dance here. She left Newport News and w w drove to Richmond just to bring Dr. Dance here so we could spend some time together. We haven't seen each other since c before COVID. So, you know, it's been a long, long time. Uh, Daryl, I guess, thank you <laughs> for, for such a wonderful and generous introduction. I'm grateful to have watched your brilliant career and your many, many acts of generosity and, and kindness to me and so many others. And most of all, oh, I know I'm blessed to have you as a friend. Thank you. I need also to acknowledge the presence of this morning of two of the most important people in my life, my beautiful daughter, Brennan Houston Vassar, back there in the red, and my grandson, Isaiah, who, by the way, is graduating from high school this year. And Isaiah is accompanied by his grandfather, attorney Bobby Vassar, a graduate of the University of Virginia's Law School. Bobby drove from Richmond to Washington to pick Isaiah up to bring him to see his grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so when Dr. Aldridge and I were, he requested that I select a topic and after a few days we got together and exchanged ideas and after some consideration we decided on the topic that's on the program and on the bill billboards and the invitations that you receive from teaching at Lane High School to working in the Obama administration, colon, an educator's journey. You know, but Charlottesville was not the beginning of my life, of course. And my background before Charlottesville certainly formed the foundation and prepared me for Charlottesville and the other adventures that were my life. My life, my life, is a life filled with dreams, family, friends, hard work, many challenges and disappointments, and clearly a miracle or two. On many occasions, I've been known to say that my life has been a series of lucky accidents. However, I do realize that there are very few accidents in life and even fewer life events that are determined by luck. I believe that a power way beyond me provided me with people, guidance, help, and strength whenever I felt overwhelmed, disappointed, or just alone. I grew up in a small town in Tennessee, Newport. Newport was and is small. It's located at the base of the Great Smoky Mountains and Dollywood. You might know where that is. <laughs> Newport was a town of segregated housing, schools, water fountains, church and churches. It was a town that boldly ad advertised colored and white only signs in the window of Allen's print shop. My school was a one level school with a two story addition that housed grades one through 12. And I grew up with a family and in a family my father, Floyd Wesley Houston, who went to work every day, either as an automobile mechanic or in later years in a chemical plant. On weekends, Floyd drank locally grown and manufactured white lightning moonshine <laughs> illegally, illegally. He drank it to forget events in his own life that he never shared with his four children. 
My mother, Irene Sophie Ellen Smith Houston. My mother, a brilliant one who attended Marstown College, but transportation and poverty forced her to quit after one year. My mother often quoted Paul Lawrence Dunbar poems to me as a child and at times gave us children instructions for chores in the limited French that she remembered from Marstown College. I had parents who had dreams for their children, but they could not have begun to dream for themselves. Hampton University student <laughs> and my godchild, her daughter. My two sisters, Margaret and Sylvia, were different souls. Margaret graduated from Hampton Co Marstown College and the University of Hartford with both master's and bachelor's degrees and retired from the Hartford public school system after 30 plus years. Sylvia was more of a homebody type. She attended Tennessee State University for one semester, but homesickness brought her back to Newport where she lived, raised a family, and died at 59. Floyd Jr., not having any interest in college, moved to Wil Milwaukee and lived there with his wife and son until he passed away. And then there was Esther Houston, the youngest child who collected the Sears Roebuck catalogs left for her on the front porch by Mrs. Branch, the black doctor's wife who lived just across the street. From these catalogs, Esther decorated houses created from taped together shoeboxes with cardboard to divide them into rooms for her paper dolls. Esther had Betty Grable paper dolls. Her Betty Grable paper dolls, maybe you all had some paper dolls when you were growing up. I don't think they make them anymore. Esther's baby, uh, Betty Grable paper dolls got new names and brown faces and black hair so Betty could look more like her. So Betty Grable became Esther Houston, and she went into her beautiful house in a city that was not Newport. You see, Esther was a dreamer. I, of course, was that little girl. I loved going to school. I now realize how exceptionally talented my teachers were. There was no ability grouping in my school, and some classes had mixed grade levels, and every child learned to read, write, speak, respect themselves, other adults, and other children. On Sundays, we went to church, and the children attended Sunday school and the church service. That happened for a lot of you in here. My parents read the Newport Plain Talk, the Knoxville Sentinel, the Chicago Defender, Jet Magazine, and Ebony Magazine. I read the Chicago Defender newspaper, Jet and Ebony Magazines. These were the publications that helped me to define myself, clarify my ambitions, believe that my dreams were attainable and could become my real life. In Ebony and Jet, I saw people who lived the kind of life that I yearned for. I learned about people who were changing and redefining the world that I then lived in. I dreamed, but I could not even begin to dream what God had in store for this little girl from Newport, Tennessee. It was in Ebony magazine that I read about a Washington, D.C. university named Howard. It was in Sunday school that the Brown versus Board of Education Topeka, Kansas decision was read to the children and adults in Woodlawn Methodist Church. The Supreme Court's decision, unanimous, unanimous decision by the way, in Brown versus Board of Education was the product of hardworking, diligent attorneys, the best attorneys in the world including Constance ba Baker Motley, who later served as a judge in New York City, Spotswood Robinson, who later became chief judge of the United States Supreme Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia, yeah. Jack Green Greenberg, who was head of the Legal Defense Fund, and of course, 
James Nabret, who was the president of Howard University when I was a student at Howard University, and Oliver W. Hill, who was one of my personal heroes and my dear friend, who dedicated his life work to fighting for equality and justice for all. Yep, I remember. I remember when the public schools in the United States of America were to desegregate. I remember. May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously, 9 to 0, that racial segregation in public schools violated the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. The decision declared that separate educational facilities for white and African American students was inherently unequal. This decision helped inspire the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. These were the years that explained and defined my childhood and the person that I eventually became. I graduated from Tanner School just eight years after the Brown versus Board of Education. And Tennessee, like Virginia, remained segregated. I dreamed about attending a college and apply, applied to Spelman, Fisk, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville College, and Howard University. And I was accepted to them all. I chose Howard University. Why? Because of the articles I read in Ebony and Jet. <laughs> As I re reflect, I now realize how wonderful and insightful my parents were. They always let us know that if we wanted to go to college and had the grades, that we would go. So we went. I continued to marvel at the fact that my parents allowed me, their youngest, their baby, to board a Greyhound bus alone to attend Howard University in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. and Howard University, a city and a university that I had never seen or visited until, and my, a city and university that my parents never saw or visited until their youngest child graduated. Yet, they had faith in God and trust in me to allow me to attend this school where nobody we knew ever attended. In a city that was totally alien to both my parents and to me. Arriving in the large, intimidating city, I had no idea what adventure lay ahead of me, but I was darn eager to begin it. At Howard, I learned from, from and about brilliant professors, most of whom looked like me. I attended classes with contemporaries who would become leaders in a fast-changing world. Howard exposed me to students and faculty from around the world, African, Indian, Asian, black, white, Caribbean. Howard introduced me to famous lawyers, educators, and academia, Sterling Brown, Arthur P. Davis, Daryl, you mentioned Sterling Brown, Arthur P. Davis, John Hope Franklin in academia. And I lived among students who were my contemporaries, who would later become renowned leaders and artists, like Stokely Carmichael, Houston Baker, Donnie Hathaway, who married my roommate, <laughs> Debbie Allen, Roberta Flack, Jesse Norman, Elaine Jones, the first black woman to attend the University of Virginia Law School, and countless others. And I said to myself, what a wonderful world. It was Howard University that reinforced my identity and my self-confidence. I began my professional career in Southeast Anacostia, teaching English at Frederick Douglass Junior High School. That's what they were called then. And I, I guess what is significant about this period, because I didn't stay long, is that I met my oldest and dearest friend, Miriam, Miriam Hewitt Mann Norton, who lives in Atlanta. And we formed a friendship that has shared first jobs, marriages, the birth of our children, divorces, deaths of loved ones, illness, secrets, and joy. A friendship that has lasted and it is strong today as it was in 1967, 56 years ago. I emphasize this because I said there were people in my life. 
not just jobs. During the summer of 1969, I got a scholarship to come and study at the University of Virginia for eight weeks. I took four courses under the regular professors that were in the faculty here in English. And I decided to return to the University of Virginia to continue graduate school in 1969-70 school year, second semester. And today, I have returned. You do know, you students in here, that until 1970, the University of Virginia was mostly all white males. There were a few women, mostly in education and nursing, eight or nine black women in professional or graduate school, one of which I was, six black undergraduate students, 17 black law students. As I remember, there were only three black professors while I was here, and they came I came before them. Wesley Harris, I think, was here first. He was in engineering, Houston Baker in English, and Dr. Joseph Washington in religion. In 1970-1971, the university admitted just under 100 black students, in addition to the number of white women. The adjustment to the university by this small number of minorities was not easy, especially for the earlier 30 or so, and the even fewer before that. But that's another story for another time. Today, many young people, and I think this is important, many young people and even older folks think that many events in history, something that happened so long ago, should stay in history, and we should just get over it. Well, let me share a short timeline of events that happened in the past but not so far in the past. Events that happened before and during my life, events that influenced all of our lives, defined and determined all of our development, and in many ways, all of our futures. Let's just start with 1863. I wasn't alive then, Daryl, were you? <laughs> <laughs> we were not alive then. On January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation as the nations approached its third year of the Civil War. Although Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation, it certainly didn't become meaningful in most slaves' lives until the Union victory and surrender of Robert E. Lee to General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox on April the 9th, 1865. That was the time that the Civil War ended, and it did not become functional until the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished slavery, happened December 1865. It was also the same time when white slave owners received compensation by the government for their loss and the abolition of slaves, and they could no longer own people or profit from free labor. Most of us don't know that. A very important historical figure in my educational experience was W.E.B. Du Bois. Now I mentioned Du Bois because Du Bois was born in 1868 and that was just three years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Du Bois, du Bois lived a long life. He died on August 27th 1963, one day before Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech in Washington, and I was somewhere in that back crowd because I was a student at Howard. So you see where I'm going here. Hampton is relevant for all of us. In 1828, white men were given the right to vote. 1870, black men were allowed to vote with serious restrictions. White women were given the right to vote in 1919. And realistically, black women were basically banned from voting until the 1965 Voting Rights Act. In 54, Brown versus Board of Education. 1957, President Eisenhower signed the Civil Rights Act. May 1960, President Kennedy signed the Civil Rights Bill. And in 1964, President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act prohibiting discrimination in hiring and promoting uh, situations. And on 19, on in 1965, 
the Voting Rights Act was signed. Now this act actually outlawed many discriminatory practices like ownership literacy tests that I talked about with black men being allowed to vote so early. You thought we could vote really? Not really. And we know that as recently as 2020, we all heard our beloved Congressman John Lewis's dying wish in 2020 that Congress vote to extend, now listen, to extend the Voting Rights Act, which will expire soon. You know it didn't happen. This timeline that I just shared reveals a shock, shocking fact to me. It is a fact that every right that I supposedly have required an act or a law and even a war. This fact definitely affected my life and who I am today. The awareness of or lack of awareness affects all of us and shows us that history is not so far in the past and in today's world it is certainly should not be forgotten. Yesterday was history but I still remember that. But I have veered from my topic which is from teaching to Lane High School to working in President Obama's administration and educator's journey. I came to teach at Lane while my husband completed his final year and a half in law school. As I look at the pictures of Lane now, I'm just looking at it from its front view, I can begin to understand the anxiety and intimidation that the black students must have had upon entering this massive, typically his, historical Jeffersonian structure. When I came as a teacher in the 1970s, I had not seen Lane its, in, in its entirety because we parked in the back in the parking and we entered from a back door. Students come in, came in the front door. So those kids, came and saw what I didn't see. I never noticed the steps that led to the entrance or the four columns that framed the entrance. And I can only imagine now how my students must have felt ascending the steps into the building's entrance, those same steps and landings where white teachers stood on those landings and said things because of desegregation they yelled obscenity and hatred in opposition to the Supreme Court decision of 1954. Let us put this in proper perspective. The black high school, Jackson P. Burley High School, graduated its final class in 1967, the year I graduated from Howard, the same year that I graduated, and third years after Brown versus the Board of Education. I came to Lane just two and a half years later, the second semester during 1969-70. The students I taught were new to integration, entering Lane in the 10th grade in August or September 1969. My kids, as I refer to them, <laughs> had grown up together, attending grade school from kindergarten to sixth grade in the same class. After the sixth grade, Jefferson House uh, classes, <clears throat> after Jefferson School, which is now the Jefferson Center, they lived in the same classes, but they went to three white junior high schools. They were separated, but they came back home from those schools and they played with their classmates from the year before and they went to the same churches and they lived in the same neighborhoods. So they remained unified. That's unusual. I would not be here if that hadn't happened because I inherited those kids in their 11th grade. Now at Lane, as I said, in junior high school, as it was called, these kids were separated and sent to three previously all-white schools. 
Three years later, they were reunited and entered Lane, the only high school in the city. These kids maintained their bond. After all, they all still had to go home. A semester before my arrival at Lane, the students requested strongly that the school hire black teachers and other African American and on offer African American history and literature courses in the school curriculum. I wasn't unaware of these, these requests. I wasn't here, but I walked into it a year after they had made these demands. So I was unaware at the time until I showed up there that there were no black teachers in academic areas of English and history, and unaware that there'd never even been a school-wide black history program. So when the principal asked me to organize the black history program for the school, I gladly agreed. I think that the school administration saw me as the answer to their problems regarding earlier black demands. I was in my early 20s. I was also not aware that my appearance surprised and concerned <laughs> the administration. My appearance, you see my appearance? I think there's another one. Is there next, no, that's the only one. The we didn't have one with the, the turban. With the turban. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, coming from Washington, D.C. and Howard University, I looked normal. Young, proudly black, large afro, mm -hmm. bright colored turbans, and African print dress dresses on occasion. Neither was I aware un that until last year, 2022, that in the eyes of the black students, my appearance and my obvious love of black literature, black history, black art, and of black people served as an anchor and an inspiration to the black students that I taught and those whom I did not teach, according to Johanna, God, George, <laughs> Johanna. I, I'm getting emotional here. During my tenure at, tenure at Lane, I taught 11th grade English classes. <laughs> And, and incorporated literature and history by and about black people in my English classes. The black students in all grade levels joined me in planning and executing the first black history full assembly program that the principal had asked me to direct. We practiced and we worked to present a class act program to the Lane and Charlottesville communities. We performed the program on two different days because the auditorium at Lane was not even large enough to accommodate the entire student body and teacher population as well as outside interested parents and community leaders. The program consisted of a short play, a creative dance, and music arranged and performed by gifted black students. Amen. The first day of the program arrived and my kids were prepared, excited, and proud of their program. This program was something that they could claim own, and it was a program they could continue, cont contribute to the school that housed nothing of their awards, of their achievements, or history from Jefferson School or Burley. And they wanted <coughs> And they couldn't attend these schools because they, they were closed now. So this was a chance to show the teachers at Lane that they mattered and that they had previously won awards and had talent too, just like all the awards that lined the halls of Lane, which spoke to the white kids' achievements and awards. Well, in preparation for the large crowd on that big day, I had several ushers to manage the crowd because it was packed. And so I'd have the ushers to uh, approach each row at the end of the program and indicate that those rows could exit. Now, the first day's program was a smash. Standing ovation at the end and clatters of praise as the standing audience exited their roles, listening to the three songs that the black students sang during that the dismissal. 
the day was perfect. Full of praise and congratulations from students, faculty, and visitors. On the second day, we presented the same program. At the end of the program, after making the appropriate acknowledgments, and after, after the students, to my surprise, presented me with a dozen roses, I prepared to exit the stage as the ushers were dismissing the audience, accompanied by the singing of the three songs. I looked at the beaming faces of my students, who were seated to the left from the stage, and briefly glanced beyond them to the audience. And I noticed a, a commotion on the right side, in the middle rows. Fifty white students were forcing their way out into the aisle, pushing past and into the, the people that were in their way. My expression immediately changed, changed into shock, actually. And the black students noticed the change on my expression and followed my eyes to the chaos that was erupting behind them. They saw white kids pushing and shoving past others in the audience and pushing the ushers out of their paths to make their protest exit. As they turned toward me again, my students, seeking some sort of explanation or justification for what was happening to them, I had no explanation or answers to give them, and I only had tears because I looked at the disappointment, the pain, and the tears that replaced those happy faces just a second ago. Three boys jumped to the stage, and I suppose hoping for me to help them to understand or to make sense of it all. After all, as George said, I was their anchor. Excuse me. But I stood there as if I was frozen and silent, trying unsuccessfully to hold back the swelled up tears in my eyes. One of the boys who had jumped on the stage saw that I had tears in my eyes. He yelled, damn it, they made Miss Vassar cry. I quickly raised my hand and said, don't do anything. And I went to the edge of the stage and repeated the same to the students who were on my left side. And I said louder, don't do anything, so they could hear me over the noise behind them. The students stayed calm. I just learned last year in 2022 from James that the principal called together 16 black and 16 white students the next day to discuss the events of the previous day. I was not included in the meeting, so I didn't know about it. After the meeting, the principal announced the punishment for the white students who had violently disrupted an orderly assembly. Two days suspension over the weekend. Once again, Lane, Lane had failed the black students, but this time, the students meant to fight back. They refused to attend classes and daily walked the hall singing, We Shall Overcome. Yes. Meanwhile, the school administration continued to grapple with the situation and further displayed their ineptness and their lack of understanding of their problem. The students grew more frustrated, and I received hate mail every day. Every day as the students walked the hall, I saw the hurt in their faces and heard it in their voices. I never had an opportunity to speak to them when they were marching up the halls. And never got to, we never got to share the mutual pain that we all experienced in the classroom and what they experienced in the classroom and the school. I could not even express the pain that I was experiencing upon realizing that racism had many ways of expression during this new era of civil and human rights. And all the new laws didn't make a darn bit of difference 
it didn't stop the outward expressions of hate. Well, the school closed, and nobody knew how to fix what was happening. Black parents called me, and they asked me if I would please tell their kids to go back to classes. I told them to tell your kids to go back to Lane, graduate, and get the hell out of there. <laughs> the media was filled with coverage about Lane. That's an old paper that I found tucked in a book miraculously of all the books and pictures and things that I have, and I brought it. It's now in the Jefferson Museum, but it rotted almost. So these are old pictures. Um, the media was filled with Lane High School situation, the Lane White High School situation. Our home phone rang constantly. News reporters wanted interviews. And I stopped answering the phone. Finally, the Charlottesville School Board had an, planned and had an emergency school board meeting to settle this mess and to hear from the public. Black parents called to ask whether I was going to the meeting, and I said, no, I'm not going. The parents persisted and said that they were coming to pick us up me and Bobby up, and they were going to take us to the meeting, and other parents would save us seats because the place would be packed. And a large capacity place they expected to attend. So we, of course, agreed to attend. Sure enough, the parents came to take us to the school board meeting, and as we were leaving, I checked our mailbox to find it filled with mail, mostly letters and cards from white students and adults from the community who had attended the program, and several of my professors from the University of Virginia. All the mail sent to my home was positive and supportive. One letter written by and signed by six white students whom I did not teach touched me. I clutched that letter as we ascended the front steps to this school. We opened the door, and as we opened the auditorium door and stepped into the large room packed with mostly white people, with a few black people who were mostly seated, seated together, our seat savers, they saw us, and they were becoming impatient. They motioned for us to come and take our seats because there were people who didn't have seats. White speakers were recognized by the board chair and spoke one after another. They spoke angrily and passionately about the program but mostly, they talked about that teacher <laughs> and what that teacher had done to their students. They spoke after, one after another as if they had attended the program. <laughs> one of them said that that teacher, I, had made their children stand and pledge allegiance to the Black National Anthem. <laughs> Now, you know I didn't do that. I may have been young, but I am not foolish. I listened to the lies and accusations and waited for the principal, the assistant principal, a teacher, anybody to say something because the attacks had ceased being about the program and began being directed at me, that teacher. I was frightened, but the seat savers were becoming impatient, and we slowly began to walk to our seats. I kept expecting someone to scream, there she is, <laughs> but no screams came, and no one even took notice of our arrival or our slow walk to our seats. I realized then that the complainers didn't even know who I was. Mm. They did not even know me. We took our seats and I continued to wait for someone to say something. <sighs> Will someone please say something? My mind screamed. I thought, just say, that didn't happen. That would have been enough. But nobody said a mumbling word. So I knew that I had to say something. So I had to speak for myself and my kids. I stood to be re recognized by the board to speak. The lone black school board member, Reverend Henry Mitchell, who knew me, recognized me to speak. And I spoke. I told them what happened. I told them that 50 white kids heard that one of the songs sung during the medley of songs at the end of the program 
was Lift Every Voice and Sing, listed that way on the program. Those 50 kids who had actually attended the first day went home that night and they somehow heard that that song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, was called the Negro National Anthem. So they called around that night and planned an action that disrupted an, an orderly school program the next day just because they felt that they should be offended by this religious song. And to further illustrate the ignorance of their actions, they walked out on the wrong song. <laughs> I still had that letter from the six students in my hand. And I opened it and I said, you know, I want to read something to you. It's a, a letter written by and signed by six of your students. The letter said, Dear Mrs. Vassar, we are writing to apologize for the ignorant students who walked out during your black history program because ignorant people don't apologize for themselves. Mm. We heard that you received hate mail and we are sorry. We are not in your classes, but we see you in the hallways when you're on hall duty and you look dignified and beautiful. We understand that they made you cry. Mrs. Vassar, don't let them see you cry. Mm. I continued, this letter is signed by your kids. Perhaps you could ask some of your kids, the principal or a teacher, about the program and what really caused the problem that necessitated this meeting, since none of you seemed to have attended. I then sat down and the auditorium was absolutely silent. Those angry voices that were so loud and vocal earlier were silent. Reverend Mitchell spoke next. He said, before we dismiss this assembly, I want to read something to you. And then he proceeded to read the words to lift every voice and sing. The last words spoken before the official dismissal were those of Reverend Mitchell who said, now, what's offensive about that? The meeting was dismissed and the earlier loud, angry people quietly disappeared into the night. When the school reopened, I submitted my official resignation to the principal, effective at the end of the school year. We left Charlottesville and moved to Roanoke and I suppressed that memory until last year. None of my friends had ever heard me speak of this. Selene called me the next day. He said, Esther, Queen Esther, you never spoke to me about that. And I said, I never spoke about it. I'd buried it for 51 years. And I suppose the Lane High School experience for, uh, I suppressed the Lane High School experience for 51 years until George Ohana contacted me on Facebook last year and said, Mrs. Vassar, I am one of your students from Lane High School. Well, since my time is short, and I know you're getting tired of hearing me, I wanted to, it was, I was supposed to go to the Obama administration, and I'm just going to tell you what I did, because this is not a resume builder, I'm retired. <laughs> After graduation and resignation from Lane, we headed to Roanoke, where my husband had accepted a job with legal aid. I carried with me my resume, just in case I saw an uh, opportunity to get a job. As we traveled back to Charlottesville, I noticed a sign that said Hollins College. You all have been to Hollins. Imagine Hollins 50 years ago. A school that I'd never heard of. Anyway, I said, I thought that might be an opportunity for me. So we found Hollins, drove into a parking spot on the campus, looked around, the campus was beautiful and looked rich. As we sat in the car contemplating whether or not to even get out of the car and try to find the employment office, a young black woman saw us. She immediately came over and asked, are you looking for a job? <laughs> <laughs> that should have been key. I said, yes. She said, well, <clears throat> she insisted that we come with her to the dean's office. 
So we followed her to Dean Wheeler's office. Dean Wheeler offered me a job as assistant dean, and, and I said, I want the option to teach a course in English. Offered this job, job on the spot. More than 20 years later, a young professor from Hollins interviewed me in my home. Ethel Morgan Smith, a Hollins alumna, was writing a book about Hollins College and especially about the hidden community of servants and workers called the Hollins Community. Ethel's title of the book was From Whence Cometh My Help. Now the inside jacket of Ethel's book reads, in 1842, Charles Lewis Cock arrived in Roanoke, Virginia with 16 slaves. There he founded Hollins College, an elite women's school. Many of the students also brought their slaves to college with them. Upon emancipation, many of the African Americans in the community, mostly women, stayed on as servants, forming what is now called the Hollins community. Although the slaves played a major part in building Hollins, the students were strongly discouraged from acknowledging them as people. That was the Hollins that I found in 1972. But Ethel determined to give a voice to African American, that community, that community that served as the silent workforce for Hollins College. Ethel Morgan, Morgan Smith succeeded in finding individuals who would step forward and tell their stories. While at Hollins, I too found, or was found by the African American Hollins community, 20 years before Ethel returned to Hollins as a professor and recorded the history of the Hollins community. <clears throat> Ethel found me in Richmond 25 years after my departure from Hollins. While I was at Hollins, I introduced an African American literature class, served as assistant dean to the college, unofficially served as surrogate mother, advisor, confidant, and friend to the 30 black student, women students there, developed an, an African American lecture series. And as an extension of the short term of Hollins, I and another black, a white faculty member and several black and white Hollins students collected census information and what was needed in the community and submitted it to the uh, Hollins community upon my departure. And Bobby and I succeeded in acquiring land from Hollins College to build a playground for the families in the Hollins community. And, and, and Ethel came to interview me. And in Ethel's book, I'm chapter 10. <laughs> so, <laughs> Psalms 121, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Clearly, Hollins College's help not only came from the Lord, but from the Hollins community of formal uh, descendants of slaves. Next stop was Washington, D.C., Howard University. A wonderful four years from 72 to 76, teaching, buying a home in Arlington, and welcoming a son. son Banyan Norris Vassar, Isaiah's father. Mm -hmm. While at Howard during those four years, I taught composition, literature, both English and American and black literature, advised students and attended meetings. No drama. I had wonderful students, and I enjoyed being back on the campus of my childhood dream. A highlight of those years was visiting Dr. Arthur P. Davis, who with Sterling Brown, wrote the first anthology of black literature, Cavalcade. Any day that Dr. Davis came to the campus and I was there, I made it a point to go there and talk and learn from this great man. I listened to his stories and discussed literature and world events with this educator who was, and it was magic to me. I was a student again, listening to a master scholar and educator. Another highlight, which just arose last year. You know, I said my whole career and life has been a series of lucky accidents, it seems. But just last year, I was talking to a young lady in uh, Orlando, 
And we were talking about Oliver Hill. I was giving a lesson about Oliver Hill. She was not a student. She was a grown woman. But anyway, she Googled it. And she took a picture of a bronze bust that Paul De Pasquale, who did Arthur Ashe's statue, and I, he did the sculpting. I raised the money. And it was the first and only statue. I don't know if you got one now, Cynthia, but it still stands there. And it's at the entrance to off of the interstate. And you see, first thing you see is the Richmond Center. And there's Oliver Hill. But anyway, I looked up what this, um, just this young girl, she called me and said she saw that there was a bus there. And that was my bus. So I said, where did you find it? She said, I Googled it. So I Googled Oliver Hill as a black lawyer and saw the bus. But in addition, on that same page, because it had a lot of things about black uh, lawyers, I saw this book cover. And it, it, she, said that she, had, she said she had, she had a whole article. She said, I loved Howard University. And she talked about how wonderful it was to be taught by black teachers and to be able to be black, because she hadn't experienced that before. But the caption under the book said, I idolized my English teacher, Esther Vassar. That's all it said. I said, what, what? I said, I do not know anybody called Nikichi, Tiafa. And she appeared, she said, she appeared, Esther Vassar, she appeared to be socially conscious and wore her hair natural when she was not sporting an African head wrap. She was pregnant during my first year at Howard and looked radiant. I reveled in writing papers for her class. One of my favorite being Black Love is Black Wealth, Nikki Giovanni and her works. Professor Vassar loved it as well. Commenting in the margins, excellent. I'm so happy to have taught you English 02 and 03. I don't remember that. That was 49 years ago. I taught Nikichi in 1973-74. 41 years ago, she sent me this book, which was published in 2021 and 2022. We're now friends. We're now friends. Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I was fortunate to work with Dr. Sonia Stone in the African American Studies Department at, the U at UNC Chapel Hill. During that time, I was teaching at UNC Chapel Hill I was responsible for placement of African American studies majors. And I was to prepare meaningful internships for those students. In addition, Dr. Ruth Kennedy, who was from North Carolina Central University, and I co-developed a curriculum designed to enable teachers in the public schools to incorporate African American literature and history into their own classes. After developing the curriculum, we taught teachers how to do that. We next moved to Hampton and Hampton University, the same year that Bill Harvey became president, 1979. And during those years, Dr. Jesse Lemon Brown and Dr. Nancy McGee were still included in the Hampton extended family, although they were retired. I made it my business to get to know them, these women, provided yet another great experience and learning opportunity for me, directly from the mouths of the history makers. Both brilliant educators served as mentors and friends to me until they passed. Hampton was wonderful, just as Howard was, just smaller. But the students there also won my heart and my attention. And there were highlights there in my life while living in, ha in Hampton. Teaching Hampton students was a pleasure, and there are students whom I taught who are now my friends and part of my family. One such student, she came in late. Where, Robin, where are you? Robin. <laughs> and, her, her, and her daughter, my goddaughter. So there was one student, Robin, who was from California, never had a black teacher, and she was in my freshman English class and every other class that I taught at Hampton. <laughs> I believe. She sat in the front row of the class, directly in front of my desk, smiling. All during the semester, there she sat. During parents' weekend, there was Robin in her usual seat. And the difference was there were her parents, Bob and Judy, 
sitting beside her. At the end of the class, the family approached me to introduce themselves. They said they just had to meet this teacher who so impressed their daughter and was mentioned in every correspondence and conversation that they heard or had with their daughter. That moment became a bond that lasts, lasts to this day. Robin babysat for me as a student, and today Robin is a successful woman with a family. Leonard, her husband, who claims that I am his cousin. <laughs> Robin's parents, Bob and Judy, who are my wonderful friends, and Jillian, her beautiful daughter, a Hampton graduate, and my godchild, whose upcoming destination wedding we're about to plan, all the family and my family. <laughs> so that was Hampton. It was during this period in 1980 that my daughter joined our family, eight weeks early, weighing three pounds, 12 ounces, born at the King's Daughter Hospital in Norfolk, high-risk hospital, transferred to Hampton General, incubated for a month, and came home at five pounds. Just look at her now. <laughs> uh, I also split my time between, between Hampton before I started working full time there, between Hampton and William and Mary. And I, there I taught one English class per year and created a lecture series to bring prominent black scholars and artists to the campus. That didn't exist which included Houston Baker, Maya Angelou, Ozzie Davis, Judge A. Leon Higgin Higginbotham, Oliver Hill, to name a few. And I also directed the STEP program. I got a STEP kid from VCU, who is now a doctor, and who came from Richmond to be here upon, where did you hear about this? I looked on the website. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, see how things happen? And uh, I, I directed the summer transition in Richmond program at William & Mary. We remained in Virginia, but moved to Richmond when Bobby joined Chuck Robb's administration, and I joined the faculty of Virginia Commonwealth University and met Daryl. At VCU, I taught English and directed the Writing Center. During this time frame, I visited Senegal, West Africa, with a group of black artists. I fell so much in love with the people and the, the beautiful products that they produced, that I, okay, I came back home and I decided I was gonna start a business <laughs> in addition to teaching, which I did, and then of course, Vassar Imports was born. My customers were all my friends, some new acquaintances, Judge Higginbotham, he would call me when I'd go and call me and say, bring something back for my wife and daughter. I said, what do you want? He said, anything you pick. <laughs> and L. Douglas Wilder, who was at that time a prominent Virginia lawyer, previously a Virginia State Senator and now serving as Lieutenant Governor under Chuck Robb. 1989 was an interesting year. Doug announced that he was running for Governor of Virginia. My children were growing up fast and my husband and I divorced. Busy year. Well, as you know, L. Douglas Wilder won the election and was sworn in as the first black governor to be elected in these United States of America. January 1990, the entire world was happy, it seemed, at least the state of Virginia. <laughs> Governor Wilder and Virginia were subjects being discussed around the world, and I felt that the world was on its way to being turned right side up again, <laughs> finally. <laughs> Folks came to Virginia from around the world to attend his inauguration and the ball that followed. We stood in the cold to hear his speech, and we danced to the electric slide at the ball. <laughs> you, you notice that wouldn't happen if he hadn't been governor, I will tell you. Governor Wilder was sworn in and inaugurated as governor of Virginia on January 13, 1990. A sh few short weeks later, on the 5th of February, Governor Wilder appointed me director of the Virginia Department of Minority Business Enterprises. These were exciting times. I was charged with increasing and opening business opportunities for minority businesses, minority business owners in state government procurement. Additionally, I was assigned or was to be the overseer of one of the governor's primary priority initiatives, 
to establish trade, educational, and cultural relationships with the continent of Africa. Those were magical times. As a result of the governor's initials and, and initiatives dealing with Africa, the Commonwealth of Virginia hosted two major African conferences, to, and in, one in 1990 and one in 1991, each with more than 700 registrants and representation from 21 African countries. This was the first time that any country, much less state, had done this. Never had there been a conference based on trade with an African country, not aid, trade. And there was another conference, the, Af the Southern African Development Coordinating Conference in 1992. Additionally, Governor Wilder led the very first trade and cultural mission to, for three weeks, to seven African countries. So there were so many things that happened that I don't think they're actually documented anywhere, even though that was over 30 years ago. Because I had, I had all the materials. And I, whenever the new governor came in, I, took a, I went down to the office and I said, um, I've got all this information about the trade mission and the trade initiatives. Do you want them? The secretary said, no, we don't have any use for them. Mm -hmm. So that died. We all, uh, actually, we all opened two trade offices in two different countries. They closed. First act, George, Governor Allen did, was to close those offices. The Wilder years were wonderful, but like most things, those years ended at the end of his term in office. And unlike previous years, when a gubernatorial appointment opened up all kinds of avenues for future jobs in private sector and government. Didn't happen for those who looked like me. So I had to create job opportunities for myself for the next year as a sole proprietor of E.H. Vassar Enterprise, my new source of income. So for eight years, I had to earn a living. First time I hadn't had a job but it worked out fine. Eight years ended, now Senator, our Senator, your Senator, Mark Warner, mm -hmm. ran for governor and won it. And following him, Tim Kaine, now former Richmond mayor, former governor of Virginia, and now the second U.S. Senator from Virginia won. First, Mark Warner appointed me as commissioner of alcohol for the state of Virginia. Mark Warner, uh, I was one of three commissioners. Tim Kaine, won, Tim Kaine won the following four years, and he appointed me chairman. That's unusual. It's unusual for me because I don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean and all of them made fun. They said, and we had a gun. I took the courses and I passed it. And I said, they said, they gave her a gun? <laughs> But those were good years because I never look at a job as just a job that should be on a resume. I look for ways that I can enhance it by doing a public service. And I created programs at ABC that are still in effect today, like the Safe Ride Home. Now that's not, but it's still in history books because we won local, national, and world acclaim from the liquor community. It was. I was upset because every weekend I would read about some military person getting off a boat, coming from Afghanistan, getting into a car, going to a bar, having an accident, and killing himself or others. These were 18-year-old, 19-year-olds. You all remember that. And I said, I can't do this. I got letters from mothers after prom week and the picture with daughters who were killed in accidents because they were drinking liquor in the limousine. And I said, this, there has to be something. I said, I may be regulating this, but there has to be some way. I'm not anti-liquor, but there has to be some program to educate kids and to educate those who over -cons overly consume liquor. There has to be some way to do that. So I worked with the liquor companies. I said, you all can't advertise in Virginia like you can, you know, those flashing. I, it may have changed. 
because I've been gone since 2009. I said, but then you couldn't put, we didn't let them put the fashion lines, uh, fashion signs in the windows. So I said, you don't spend money. You couldn't advertise on local television in Virginia. So I said, you all have this budget that you're not spending on Virginia like you spent spending in Vegas. So you need to give me that money so I can create programs that make you look good. They said, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> so so the, most, the most impactful program was the Safe Ride Home for military people. So I worked with all the bars and places in Norfolk and Virginia Beach because that's where the, the most cooperative person was the head guy, rear admiral of, of, uh, of Nor in Norfolk, located in Norfolk. We trained bartenders to identify overconsumption. We got an 800 number that they could call where the liquor people were paying for a retainer, had a retainer with cab companies, and they would come and take them home or to the base free. They, liquor people loved me, this non-drinking commissioner. Because <laughs> so, they didn't have to pay for my golf whenever we went on, went on, went on uh, conferences, because I don't play golf. They didn't have to buy me the most expensive liquor when they took us out to dinner, because the only way they could show us their new products was through, you have to purchase it from the, the bar. They couldn't bring us a drink of liquor. You'd get fired, you know. So we ha they had to take us and they had to buy their own liquor at the, at the bar in order for people to taste it. Well, I, I didn't drink any of it. I, that was wasted on me. I said, don't even bother to give me that. But I like Bailey's. So, <laughs> so you can attribute any new, this, this exotic uh, cream liquors, <laughs> me. They would bring and say, Miss Bassa, taste this. Now, they could give me a taste, but you know, hey, you find something good in every job. And that's my point. That's my point. Not the Baileys, but the programs. <laughs> uh, so I always felt that my duties should also include dealing with the problems resulting from the consumption of that product. The young girl who was killed and her mama sent me a picture I worked with every limousine service in the state. They signed an agreement not to allow liquor in their limousine. Mm. Nobody had thought of that. I think probably, and please forgive me if this is sexist, only a mother would think of things like that. Yes. You know, we would think about the safety of our kids. So, but in 2008, another miracle happened for the world. <laughs> Barack Obama won the presidential election and became the first African-American president of the United States and was inaugurated on January 20, 2009. Well, it seemed that the whole world rejoiced. I spent three or four days in Washington at the Marriott. People were running in the streets kissing each other. So I realized and I rejoiced for I and every, everybody I knew we felt that our prayers had been answered, and we once again had hope. Several staff members from ABC asked me, well, whether I was planning to apply for a job in the Obama administration. I said, how ridiculous. I said, everybody's going to want to work for the first president of the United States of America. So they said, you know, Ms. Vassar, who were your former bosses? I said, what do you mean? I said, Tim Kaine first thing that he did, Barack Obama did, was have him to be head of DNC. Tim Kaine was the first governor to endorse Barack Obama. And I said, yeah, and Tim Kaine likes me. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, I said, oh, well, yeah, maybe, maybe so. I said, I said, I can get three governors, three former governors now, two of them are senators, and you know, Doug Wilder, Mark Warner, Tim Kaine, and our loans. Congressman Robert Scott. So I called him and asked him, they said, sure. So I immediately went online, because they didn't just, you go online with everybody else. And you put, you know, say who your references are. Within one week, I was invited for an interview. So I drove to Washington the night before, and Robin again found me a hotel in, at the Marriott uh, on Ninth Street. So I drove to the interview. 
I approached the guard. To, uh, well, first of all, I was in my office. The phone rang, and Joan came in, and Joan said, Ms. Vassar, somebody from the White House wants to talk to you. <laughs> I said, okay. So it was a gentleman named Ken Bennett, who was the deputy director of White House personnel, and he invited me for an interview. So I went to Washington. The next morning, I spent a good night's sleep. The next morning, I got up, got dressed, and I took a cab down to the uh, white side of the Eisenhower building. That's where they told me to come. So I went through, the, I approached the guard and was escorted to Ken Bennett's office. Mr. Ken Bennett, to my surprise, was a black man. He didn't sound black. <laughs> <laughs> As we talked, both he and I became very comfortable with one another. And I noticed a picture on a table behind his desk, and I was facing him, and he, was, he had his back to that. And I, I got up. This shows you how comfortable I was. I got up and walked to the picture and looked at it. I said, is this your wife and children? He said, yes. I said, are they here? Now, I'm interviewing him. <laughs> he said, no, we live in Chicago. I agreed to do this because the president is a friend of mine, and I may take something if it's in in uh, Chicago, but I can't disrupt my children's life to come to Washington for possibly only four years. So I said, they, they are not here? He said, no. I said, do you miss them? He said, I miss them so much it hurts. Mm -hmm. He won my heart with that statement. So we continued to talk. And he said, come on, I'm going to take you somewhere. So Mr. Bennett and I walked a long while, and he asked me to join him when he, after he inv invited me to walk with him. We walked through halls and down steps and exited the door, and, and we were cleared to enter an adjoining building. We walked down a long hall to a beautiful garden. <clears throat> Mr. Bennett said, do you know where we are? I said, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. He said, we're in the White House, and this is the Rose Garden. I wish I had a camera to take a picture. I said, no, you can't do that. Darn it, I'll never get to see this again. He simply said, yes, you will. Mm. We went back to his office, and he went to a file cabinet, opened it, and looked at my folder, I later realized. He said, what job do you want? <laughs> I, in my usual frank way, I said, um, Mr. Bennett, when would a person who looks like you have an opportunity to ask a person who looks like me that question? We both laughed. I selected the Small Business Administration. I was National Ombudsman for Small Businesses of America and Assistant Administrator for Regulatory Enforcement for Small Businesses. The job was fascinating. But clearly, the highlight of that time, in addition, there were plenty, but the main one, was I got a call, and Ann, my administrative assistant, said, Mrs. Vassar, uh, you have a call. I picked it up, and it was from the White House. They said, we would, the president would like to meet with you. And I said, OK. So we set up the time. I went to the meeting. while It was at 5 o'clock, so I worked, went to work. I guess I should have taken off, <laughs> but I went to work, and I left the office and took a cab down to the White House. I, entered, I was escorted up to an outer room, which I now know was outside the Oval Office, and there were three or four other people in there. I said, um, what are you, are you here to see the president? He, they said, yes. I said, well, why are we here? They said, we don't know. So I figured we're going to walk in, we're going to take a picture, and exit. But I said, he doesn't use that, usually do that in the office. We're sitting there. I was the oldest person in the room. These kids were like 30 and 40. And so uh, this woman came out of a side door, and she said, well, I guess I should come and uh, meet you all since I had to vote on you. Being the adult in the room, I said, why are we here? <laughs> she said, well, you know those reports that you submit. We read them. We screen them according to the ones we think are excellent. 
and then we give them to the president. He then reads them and decides what people he would like to come and have a personal visit with him. I said, oh, okay. So I'm V, so I was last. So the people went in, they took a picture, I guess, and they came out. I said, now, I'm not gonna do that. I said, I'm gonna go and I could have gone to a public meeting, stood on a stage and had a picture taken with him. I said, so I was invited here. So I went, my turn came and I was in this outer office. There were about eight people around. I guess they there to keep people from being crazy because they didn't know any of us. And so I'm standing there, he comes out, much taller than I am, as you see. <laughs> and he said, uh, Esther, I would like to thank you for the service you've been given t to the Small Business Administration. He, had no he knew everything I did. Mm. And I said, well, Mr. President, I want to thank you for giving me the privilege of doing that. So he said, well, come on in. We went into the office. Only person who was there was the photographer, his, his photographer, the presidential photographer. We started talking, and Shauna, that was not me lecturing him. <laughs> <laughs> And he asked me, what have you heard from the small businesses across the country as you travel? Now, in addition to running my office, I did, an average year, the report I sent to him, I did 52 hearings or speeches across the country. Went to 21 states. And I created the program I would take one staff member with me on every trip so they could see the people whom they were supposed to serve. I tell you, it vastly improved their attitude and their appreciation for this job to see a result for what they did for small businesses. Well, here he was asking me about, you know, we we stayed in there about 30 minutes talking. So he said, what have you heard from small businesses? And I explained some of it. And he said, well, let's take a picture. I said, because I forgot about that photographer, <laughs> you know, and so we got pose for the picture and the photographer was sitting up I said listen and this is a private joke among my friends because they say when they take a picture they I have to edit it and de delete the ones I don't like with <laughs> I'm in them so I told the photographer I said listen I want you to fix this picture so I look beautiful <laughs> <laughs> the president says you do not need to have anything fixed because you're beautiful <laughs> So, and I believed him at that moment. <laughs> so we took the picture and we continued to talk. And it got so comfortable, I said, you know, Mr. President, we share heroes. He said, really? Who? I said, Oliver Hill. He said, yes. He said, how do you know Mr. Hill? I said, well, I've been handling his schedule for the last 15 years up until he died. In fact, I directed his funeral, and we celebrated his 100th birthday uh, celebration while he was alive. And I wrote your office, your Senate office, and I asked you to write a letter wishing him happy birthday. And he said, how did you know to ask me? That's because you were a legal defense lawyer. Before, <laughs> I said, you were a public servant before you became senator and president. And it's like, how the hell did she know that? <laughs> See, he hadn't observed my adventure through life. And, and we were going out, and I said, Mr. President, we went back out into the hall. I said, I forgot something. He said, what? I said, my daughter asked me to give you a hug. He bent down and kissed me on the cheek. There was a sil almost silent gasp in the room <laughs> of the eight people who were there. But certainly that was a highlight. Now, I, am sh I retired in 2012. I received letters from Governors Wilder, Warner, Kane, and President Barack Obama. Cynthia, you were there. Robin, you were there. Shauna, you were there. Uh, uh, were you there? <laughs> <laughs> she had to introduce me then, talk then. She had to talk then, too. But by now, I'm sure I've spoken much too long. But I must tell you that this renewed acquaintance with my kids from Charlottesville, which was, this visit was made possible by that class of 1972. And it's made, you all have made me realize just how impactful one's life can be in the lives of others. Thank you for that.
my, my kids for my 11th grade classes at Lane made me realize who I am. I am a little girl from Newport, Tennessee, a little town at the bottom of the Smoky Mountains just below Gatlinburg and Dollywood. I am a student, a teacher, a volunteer, a three-time appointee by three governors, a presidential appointee, but most importantly, I am a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a friend, I am a dreamer, I am an educator who has had a wonderful life. So publicly I say thank you to my students from Lane, from VCU, from Hampton, and any other place where I've had the privilege of teaching because you have made me realize that throughout my life, in whatever job, I've always been an educator. And my thanks to this very tolerant audience this morning. Thank you. What an inspiring message. Yes. 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 You know, um, this was truly an inspiring life history that we heard here today. And I'm not going to talk too much, but I would like for members of the class of 1972, Lane High School, to say a word. And I'd like to hear some of the family members perhaps say a word, also say a word, if they don't mind. You would just, just, Tell us what's on your mind. Good afternoon. My name is Renee Hicks, and I am a former student of Dr. Vassar's. And Dr. Vassar left such an impression on me with her galets and her African attire that when I became a teacher, later on in my teaching career, I started to dress like Dr. Vassar, and I told my students why I dress the way that I did. It was because of my former teacher. And I was so inspired that I started dressing my students like that also. So I thank Dr. Vassar for what she instilled in me, the pride that she instilled for me to embrace my culture. Thank you, Dr. Vassar. Hello, I'm Corliss Turner Anderson, and I didn't have the pleasure of having her as a teacher, but I was in her play, and I think I played a major role in that. But anyway, what I want to say is thank you for my identity. That was the hardest turbulent time in my life. Being a teenager, not being accepted. I was a cheerleader, but that was the token that we needed to have. But I didn't know who I was until you stepped into that building and I realized then who I was. From that point, just like you, I sought colleges, but I went to St. Augustine University because I wanted to be around people like me. I wanted to see what other people were doing. From that, I taught for 35 years because you helped me to identify who I was, and I appreciate that. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Bryant, and I want Bernard Wissett Hammond to come up here because she was a student of Ms. Vassar. Yeah. So you're not going to get away. <laughs> but you were you a student. <laughs> I, I, all I can say is that um, I can still remember Ms. Vassar 
strutting down those halls at Lane High School with her head up high, her turbans, and her African garb. And I said, my God, she has arrived. <laughs> she has set the tone. And I just want to thank you, Ms. Vassar, for being the wind beneath our wings. Yes. We will never forget you. We love you. We honor you. And we admire you. And I'm not going to say it anymore because I'm going to start crying. So, <laughs> so thank you so much. Just your, your presentation today was just awesome. It was just uplifting and inspiring. Thank you so much for being a blessing in our lives. Hello, my name is Laura Pryor. I never had Ms. Vassar in, as a teacher, but we did have black studies, but like everyone has expounded on the blackness, our afros, the turbans, and she carried herself with excellence and authority. And I just um, thank you, Ms. Vassar. I wish I had you in my class, but we had Tony. But my first experience with being a token was at Johnson Elementary School, and I guess that helped me to transition, but not so much, but still, you had to carry yourself a certain way for anyone to accept you, but I just thank you for all that you've done, and as James said, you were the wind beneath our wings. Hello, my name is Bernadette Whitsett Hammond. And I was in the class of 1973. I was sort of like the tag along. <laughs> One of those um, students who tagged along with the class of 1972. But I do want to share that that experience when the students walked out of the African American, the black history program was extremely traumatic. And my mother was the guidance counselor at um, Lane High School at the time. And I was in utter shock. I just didn't know what to do, how to handle that situation. So I went to my mother and I said, Mom, what should I do? I don't know whether to join the sit-in or was, you know, goody good girl and trying to do the right thing and make, um, very focused on my academics. And my mother said to me, you follow your heart. You see what Ms. Vassar's going through. We're supporting her. So I joined the sit-in and never regretted it. And I think a lot of positive things did come out of that. Yes. And I thank you for that awareness. And I know it was a traumatic time for you. Thank you for all that you've done. Good afternoon. I'm Ronnie Johnson. And Dr. Vassar, Ms. Vassar, I appreciate you and love you. Um, I was a rebel. Uh, in high school, <laughs> but but I've come a I've come a long way since then. True. Uh, <laughs> what you say? True. Uh, but I admired you from afar, and um, um, I also uh, when we were in Upward Bound, uh, when you were in grad school. We, we admired you, uh, and for my life, <clears throat> just reconnecting with her last year, uh, in September of last year, brought back uh, so much hurt, because because of being a rebel, um, um, some of the things that I wanted to accomplish in high school never took place because uh, I was ostracized, you know, I was, you know, I was uh, a very good basketball player, for example, uh, in the city of Charlottesville, and we only had two middle schools. And uh, I was one of the top guards in the city and didn't make the team. Um, uh, and I carried that for a long, I mean, I carried that until September of last year. Um, um, so, you know, I'm getting emotional. So. Uh, Ms. Vassar, uh, thank you for coming to Charlottesville in 71, 72, or 73, whenever it was. <laughs> and uh, I thank God for you, and we pray that uh, uh, your retirement and uh, the rest of your life is all that you desire it to be. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm 
I'm comfortable here. I'm the preacher of the group. <laughs> I'm the pastor, so. <laughs> I'm in my right place as soon as I can pass the plate. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be, I'll be <laughs> yeah, just pass the plate, I'll be good. But I'm George Gohanna, and I'm just blessed to have had an opportunity to experience uh, Ms. Vassar. Uh, she has been an inspiration uh, to us and still is an inspiration. Uh, she has opened her heart um, to us, uh, not only then, but now. And she has received us with so much love and caring and compassion. And I'm with James. I remember her with that turban on and her African garb going down the hall. And I said, look at my girl. <laughs> look at my girl. <laughs> and I didn't even know what I was saying then, but, <laughs> but, but she, was, she was sharp. And um, she was very inspirational to, not only to me, to, to many of us at Lane, um, and even to some white students that I've heard from um, that she inspired. And she still is an inspiration. So, and I'm grateful I, when I reached out to her on Facebook and reminded her uh, who I am. Uh, she immediately responded with such joy and pleasure. And she has received us in the same way. We, we had our re class reunion uh, last year and we invited her to come and she was uh, excited to be a part of that. And she felt honored uh, to come to the reunion but we felt honored the fact that she um, gladly accepted that. And um, Dr. Derrick, he was there as well. He came to the reunion, so it was just been a blessed time and we have stayed connected. So I thank you for allowing us to reconnect and stay connected. And I wish you the very best, and I'm gonna say this in Jesus' name. I'm, I wish you the very best. And. Uh, the Bible says this, the steps of a good man is ordered by the Lord. And that's a generic term. God has ordered your steps and you have blessed so many. So thank you. You know, going to Burley, we, we were never integrated student body wise, but we did have five, five white teachers in there. And to go to a school where um, you felt accepted, where people loved you, where there was nothing but your best benefit for you, I cannot even imagine going to the white school and just being ostracized. You know, we had that, we had the village, which was our parents and the people who we saw every day. But I'm quite sure when you went there with your turban, you, they looked at you like you were a space monster because, for, number one, you were black. Mm -hmm. And then having all of this and not being accepted, um, that was a hard break to, to hold on to. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, we, you know, the thing about it is we need all to be accepted for who we are because we all bring something to the table and even now what you express it's almost like time has come back mm -hmm. and it stood still with things going on in the school system and the way things are being now that you you, you can't learn this you can't see this because of that and, we, and, and I just pray that things do change Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Before we leave, I'd like to just ask a member of the family would like to say a few words or anything. Uh, what is it like living with this extraordinary human being? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, I, I did not prepare anything, and that's my phone, of course, obviously. Oh, no, that's, maybe it's not good. It's not mine. 
good. I, I turned off my ringer. I was good. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, with, with her being my mom, um, it's easy to say, you know, that's just my mama. But um, she's always been my friend, and not the way that people say it. No, she's always been my friend. And she's the person I came to and talked to with everything, and she's also the person that I saw from a different perspective. Um, she's always been this powerful person, but for me, she was always this person that I saw that was so soft, so sweet, so sensitive. Um, what people would see as business and power, I saw as genuine care and worry. Um, I ain't never seen nobody worry so much <laughs> as, as my mama. And I adore her for that. She worried for every last one of y'all. She worried for Barack Obama. She like a mother. Um, and she did her jobs like a mother. So I had to share her with everybody. <laughs> and I'm very glad because it means I have a lot of extended family. Um, and they're my family and my friends. And um, I don't know where I'm going with this. As we stand here today and we're looking at this um, just craziness happening with racial Amen. craziness, I don't know where I stand on it because the direction that we took and pushed so hard is being kicked back so hard. Yes. But it just shows how important that our roots, our base, and our community is. Amen. So if we can just push and hold on to that, we don't have to push against that wall anymore. And if we just turn back from that wall that they keep trying to put up and put our arms back around our people and keep them there and not reach out to arms that do not want us and will slap mm -hmm. us away, let's do that. Um, I think that we should just work on development, caring, and building a family and worry a whole lot less about the integration concepts that they put for us. And we need to accept ourselves and each other and love each other like family and friends. So I want to thank you again, Ms. Fasser for blessing us with your presence, your wisdom, and your inspirational words. I doubt very seriously if this room, if this School of Education has ever had the type of energy that you brought to us today. And we thank you for it. And so at this time, uh, we're going to convene. We have some food outside. And uh, so let's continue the conversation. And Let's thank Ms. Vassar again. Thank you.